Good morning. Today is a new day. Even though it looks a lot like yesterday and all the days before that for the last couple of months, it's not. It's a brand new day that you have been given. And I am happy for myself to have another day on the planet, and I'm happy that each of you have as well. So for our words of welcome this morning, I want to say whoever you are, whoever you love, however you express your identity, you are welcome here. Whatever your situation in life, whether you're rich or poor, you are welcome here. Whatever your experience of the holy, your presence is a gift, not just to this congregation, but to the whole world. If you are needing to be alone or you're eager to engage with other people, you are welcome here. You have a place here. You belong. In fact, we all belong. We all belong here. We belong to the divine and we belong to each other. Blessed be and amen. For the chalice lighting, I want to read page 448 in our hymnal, which is, we light this beacon of hope a sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. Now, for the story for all ages, I'm going to read some of the book, When You Are Brave. This is written by Pat Zeitlow Miller and illustrated by Eliza Wheeler. Some days when everything seems scary, you have to be brave. Brave as a bird that steps from its nest, hoping to soar through the sky and not fall down. Brave as a caterpillar that builds a bed, wondering when it will wake up. Because some days are full of things you would rather not do. Those are the days you really need to be brave. And now we're going to have the hymn, Wade in the Water, which I picked before I knew there was going to be storming outside all day. So. This song is a song that Harriet Tubman would sing. She would sing at the top of her lungs to warn the slaves to get off of the path and get into the water so the dogs couldn't follow their scent. So here we have, let's think of Harriet Tubman, the underground railroad conductor who freed hundreds of slaves in her life.
today is very short. It comes to us from the wisdom of rebel chick. You are confined only by the walls that you build yourself. Thank you, rebel chick. And now, if you will get comfortable for meditation and prayer, that would be lovely. Close your eyes, take in a couple of deep breaths. Oh, great mystery of life, thank you for this day. Thank you for our health. May we be sustained by the golden light surrounding us, by the breeze that blows through the trees, and the rain that gently comes to water the land, the animals, and ourselves. Thank you for the feeling of joy that wells up in our hearts when two or more of us are connected in the name of love. Thank you for all that we are and all we shall be. Amen. So many times in life we face fear. Scary things just show up. Have you noticed that in your life? You didn't ask for them to come, but they come. And I always think about why are they here? It makes me wonder. According to E.E. E. Cummings, it takes courage to grow and become who we really are. Without the challenges in life, we can't fully form. Reminds me of an interaction I had with one of my high school schoolmates at our 20th class reunion. In high school, Steve and Jack were best friends. They were inseparable. If you saw Steve, you would see Jack. If you saw Jack, you would see Steve. So at our 20th reunion, Steve came, but Jack did not. And so I asked Steve, hey, where's Jack? And he said, oh, he's ruined. I said, what do you mean? He said, his parents are so rich that they always took care of everything for him. He never worked. He never had any pressure on him. He had tutors who did his homework for him so he could get a college degree. When he got in trouble with the law, his parents bailed him out. And he had all the money that he could ever want or need. They just handed it to him. His parents ruined his life, actually. Now, last I heard, he's doing crack. So, E.E. E. Cummings was right. Without the challenges in life, we can't fully form. So let's embrace the challenge that this COVID virus has brought to us. I don't know if it will cause us to fully form, but at least it will give us an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity to be braver, to face reality, to tell ourselves the truth, and an opportunity to do some of the things that you've been wanting to do for a long time, because there's a lot of time available at this point, because you can't go anywhere. Steve Jobs said in his 2005 graduation speak, speech at Stanford, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make big decisions. Almost everything, he said, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment, of failure, these things will just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering you are going to die is the best way to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There's no reason not to follow your heart. Jabs further said, no one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet death is our common destination. No one has ever escaped it, and that is how it should be. Because death is the very likely, the single best innovation of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make room for the new. So think about that. 
death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. And I think that's one of the gifts of the pandemic, getting us to face the possibility death could happen if we get this virus. Because it is a deadly virus, and it spreads easily. This week, it hit home for me more than before. It was the first time someone I knew died of the virus. And when I say someone I knew, I mean someone I spent one day with, one time, 30 years ago. He made quite an impression on me. He was precious and kind and gentle. He was loving and generous, one of the good guys. He was Roy Horn of Siegfried and Roy in Las Vegas. Now, I don't know if most of you know this about me, but I was an assistant to a magician for over 20 years, a world-renowned magician. And one year, we went to Las Vegas to compete in the International Magic Show competition with about 60 other contestants. We came in second, second place. We got the Silver Lion Award. And part of the winnings was getting to perform on Siegfried and Roy's stage in the Mirage. Then we got to go backstage and meet the Tigers. Then we got to sit in the front row center seats watching their show. After that, we got to go with Siegfried and Roy and the first place winners out to eat at a lavish meal. They treated us us like royalty. I got to sit by Roy for most of the meal, and he was such a gentle spirit and such a Unitarian Universalist at heart, really a gem. And I woke to the news that they couldn't save him. I cried when I found out, and I said, what? They saved Tom Hanks? Why couldn't they have saved Roy? My girlfriend, who's a stand-up comedian and a magician who worked in Vegas for several years, got to know Siegfried and Roy better than I did that one day. She said Roy had been sickly since the tiger attack in 2003. He was not well. But still, it made me realize I do not want this virus. After all, if they couldn't save Roy with all his fame and fortune, what chance do I have? So I don't want it for you either. I want you to continue to have social distancing, to wear the mask and the gloves, and don't let anybody breathe on you. You are precious and valued on this planet and in this congregation. I want you, each of you, to live a long, strong life. Please join me in a short prayer. O oh, great spirit, please watch over and heal all of those who are grieving, especially Siegfried, as well as all of those people we don't know who are family and friends of the over 85,000 deaths that have occurred in the United States caused by the virus so far. Let us send out golden light and peace to the rest of the world as well, where over 225,000 more people have died. So 310,000 people so far. Let us remember the holiness of each person who is no longer here. Let us remember the sacredness of each lifetime. We ask for the world to be healed and for strength in the days that are ahead for us. Amen. Now you might be wondering what this has to do with being brave. To me, it's about making your life count. Being brave enough to live your best life. Being brave enough to be out in the open and stand for your beliefs. 
being brave enough to listen to that still, small voice inside of you that keeps bugging you, nagging you, calling you to do something you've been avoiding for years. Being a brave enough to listen, brave enough to tell yourself the truth, being brave enough to live your faith, to stand for equality and justice for all. Because remember, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. So if you knew you only had one more year on the earth, where would you need to be braver? Where would that show up? I think there are lots of areas where we need to get braver. We need to have courage to wade in, wade in the water. That is to find those things that make us uncomfortable and go in anyways. We need to be braver in our relationships, for example. We have to have courage to be more vulnerable. Did you know the word courage comes from the Latin word core, which means heart? The word courage means to open your heart and let your authentic self stand strong. Have you arrived at your authentic self yet? Are you living the life you want to live? Are you brave enough to be true to yourself? to be transparent, to be honest, to be vulnerable? Are you brave enough to trust again, even though you have been hurt deeply? I encourage you to really think about being braver in your relationships. I also think we need to be braver in our willingness to be fully alive. Dance as if nobody is watching. Dance, dance, dance in this lifetime. Sing loudly in the shower as if nobody can hear you. Let go of those inhibitions that you've been carrying around for years. Have fun. This life offers a lot. Let's enjoy it. I think we have to be brave to have fun, to openly laugh at ourselves, to laugh openly and easily, and not to be afraid if someone else laughs at us. So what? Our life is not diminished by their laughter. Be brave enough to laugh with them. Part of being fully alive, too, is responding to that nagging, that pushing inside of you, pushing you to write a book, to finish that quilt you've been working on, to take drawing lessons, to go back to school, to get sober. Stand for yourself. Take in all the joy that you can from this lifetime and listen to that pushing inside. We also have to be braver in standing up for injustices against others. I am saddened this week by the death of Ahmad Arbery, the black man that was jogging and killed in Georgia. I am sad and think we need to stand strongly and protest. We must stand for what is right, not what is Democrat, not what is Republican. To be braver, we must stand for moral courage. Sometimes it might mean standing up to an unjust law or unjust treatment of others. For example, about 850,000 people were apprehended and taken into custody by border control last year in 2019. As of October 1st, the number of children taken from their parents had reached 1,090. I couldn't find any current statistics, but I wonder, are they still being held? Google didn't know. I'm going to write to the media and ask them. In fact, why don't we all write to the media and ask them? Ask them where their investigator reporters are and why they have let the story drop. We have to be braver. 
We have to be braver in our politics, too. I want to ask each of you to read this book, Andy Andrews' book, How Do You Kill 11 Million People? It's a short but very powerful book. It's a 15 to 20 minute read. I have copies if anybody wants to borrow one, and I will leave a copy in the fellowship's library. Hitler says, or had said, how fortunate for leaders that men do not think. Make the lie big, make the lie simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. We, as Unitarian Universalists, are the thinkers. We score the highest on SAT exams, ACT, LSAT, and the METCAT as well. The exams to get into college, law school, and med schools. We are the thinkers, the readers, the questioners. I'm not audacious enough to think that we are the only thinkers, but I am audacious enough to say there are a lot of great thinkers in our history. Thomas Jefferson, Louisa May Alcott, P.T. Barnum, Charles Dickens, Pete Seeger, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, social reformer Dorothea Dix, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Pete Seeger, to name a few. These people had one thing in common. They were all brave. P.T. Barnum, the circus owner, said, fortune favors the brave. Let's keep that in mind as we protect our democracy by willing to bravely stand for what's right. Andrew says on page 42, you see, the danger to America is not a single politician with ill intent, or even a group of them. The most dangerous thing in any nation is a citizenry capable of trusting a liar to lead them. For example, Adolf Eichmann was Hitler's right-hand man. He was given the task of implementing the final solution, that is, the elimination of all Jews. Here's an example of one of Eichmann's speeches said to a group of Jews whose neighborhood was surrounded by barbed wire one night while they were sleeping. It can be reported to you that the Russians are advancing on our eastern front. I apologize for the hasty way we brought you into our protection. Unfortunately, there was little time to explain. You have nothing to worry about. We only want the best for you. You will leave here shortly and be sent to very fine places indeed. You will work there, your wives will stay at home, and your children will go to school. You will have wonderful lives. Now, we will all terribly be crowded on the trains, but the journey is short. Men, please keep your families together and board the rail cars in an orderly manner. Quickly now, my friends, we must hurry. And so they were crammed into the rail cars and taken away to the death camps, exterminated in the gas, gas chambers. And that is how you kill 11 million people. You lie to them. But there is hope. If we are brave enough to call out our politicians when they lie to us, if we are brave enough to write to the newspapers and the media, if we are brave enough to demand honesty from our politicians, if we are brave enough not to vote for politicians who are pathological liars, we have to be braver. We have to stand for what is right, not what is politically correct, not what is comfortable, not what won't offend people. No, we have to stand for what is right. Gandhi taught us, you know what is right in your heart. Stand for that. Henry David Thoreau, who, because he was opposed to the Spanish-American War, refused to pay his poll tax and was thrown into jail. The story goes that Ralph Waldo Emerson came to see him in the Concord Jail, and he asked him what he was doing there. Thoreau replied, what are you doing out there? 
Gandhi was arrested 13 times for civil disobedience and spent over five years in his life in jail. But he also changed the world, teaching us how to protest nonviolently. This is the model that Martin Luther King championed, of course. I have another book to recommend to you, too, today. It's written by Eva Fogelman and called Conscience and Courage, a book filled with research and interviews of people who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. Their stories are remarkable and inspirational, like the 17-year-old girl who hid 13 Jews in her small apartment with her seven-year-old sister, or the story of a young boy who takes only half of his medicine while he's in the hospital so his Jewish brother can have the other half as he lay sick in hiding, not allowed to go to the hospital. Or the small village in France, Les Chaubon, where the entire village became involved in rescuing Jewish children. They rescued and saved hundreds of Jewish children over the six years of the war. The whole town was in on it. And I'm thinking of that woman in Las Vegas. She's the one that came to a concert to listen to some of her favorite bands, and suddenly there were gunshots from a window in a nearby hotel. People started running, people started screaming, people were getting hit, people were falling down from fear and injury, and she gets off the field and finds a safe place to hide, but she can see all the people out there who aren't running, who aren't safe. She told reporters afternoon, afterwards, I was afraid, but I couldn't just sit there and watch people being shot on the concert field without doing something. So she risked it, trip after trip, to help those that are still on the concert field, and she pulled many of them to safety. Do you remember those moments in your own life? I was afraid, but moments? It's okay to be afraid. It's normal. Some things are scary. Just to remember to add the comma but and do it anyway. I was afraid, but I still did it. Wade in. Be brave, even though you're afraid. Speak up when things are wrong. The Holocaust survivor and Nobel Prize winner and the author of Night, Eli Weissel has said that there is a new commandment we must remember. Thou shalt not sit idly by. Give yourself credit when you are brave. Give yourself credit when you are courageous, when you stand up for what is right. Recognizing this in yourself will help you do more of it. My younger son tells the story of when he was in junior high and he and some of his friends spent the night at another boy's house. About midnight, they went out to the graveyard that was close by and played the game called Ghost. He said it was terrifying until the moon broke out of the clouds and everything lit up. That is, when the light came on and they could see everything, it wasn't scary anymore. That's how it is with us, too. Once you turn on your brave light, turn on your light, you'll be able to see everything so much clearer, and there's no need to be afraid anymore. In A, they say fear is false evidence appearing real. And Plato said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy in life is when men are afraid of the light. Turn your light on. Remember, you are a light in this world. You are sa safe. You are supported by the universe. You are supported by this congregation. You are supported by the highest energy that there is, love. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. I believe in you, 
and I want you to do that thing that's been nagging you for years. I leave you with words of George Adair. Everything, everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. I have a saying on my refrigerator, a quote, boldness and then more boldness and then boldness again. It helped me reading that daily to find a publisher for my next book. I was afraid, but I kept querying people, I kept getting rejections, I kept on it until I found a publisher. So in the next six months, I'll have a new book out. So be braver in your relationships, be braver in fully embracing your life, be braver in standing against injustices, and braver confronting the lies that are told to us by politicians. I'm going to uh, extinguish the chalice and close with two of my favorite quotes. The first one is from Melissa Tum Tumino. The thing about being brave is it doesn't come with the absence of fear or hurt. Bravery is the ability to look fear and hurt in the face and say, move aside, you are in my way. I love that. This week as you go forth, if fear shows up, tell it to move aside, you are in my way. And finally, words of wisdom from Rebecca Ray. She was never quite ready, but she was brave. And the universe listens to brave and responds. Now we're going to have the privilege of listening to Sarah Barillis's song, Brave, on YouTube. I mean, I think the chalice already went out. Okay, so as you listen to the song on YouTube, it's kind of long, it's four minutes long, but it's worth it. Every second is inspiring and wonderful and encourages you to be braver. Blessed be and amen.